It's great to see you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, just a couple of things. First of all, uh, if you're a member here, uh, you'll want to uh, stop by the registration table and uh, sign in as a member and receive uh, a ballot that you will cast for a person who will serve on our uh, church council uh, for the next three years. And uh, you can do that anytime while you're on campus today. So if you haven't done that yet, you can do that at the conclusion of, of service. Just before we uh, go into the message, I would like us to lift up that in prayer. So Father, um, uh, you know what the future will hold. We do not. Uh, you know who will be the best fit at the table. Uh, all we want to do is as best as we can discern your will. Um, to yield to it. So we just ask that you would help us make the selection that is the one that is at the right person at the right time for us. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, today is a Vision Sunday. It's kind of our Super Bowl uh, Sunday. By the way, does anybody here still have a team that could be playing the Super Bowl today? Oh, yeah, there's a couple. Good for you. The, the rest of us have hope for next year, but <laughs> uh, Vision Sunday is uh, not just about a picture of the future that we hope for. Uh, that's important because if we don't have something to aim at and move towards, we can get disoriented in life and quite honestly disheartened. But we also understand that there are things that God has done in our lives and to not be able to notice them is a form of blindness. And so today we actually want to notice and pay attention. And this is not about us taking credit for anything. This is about us giving credit to God for his blessings in our lives. How many are grateful for the blessings of God in your life personally and then in our church family? Yes? Amen. <clears throat> now. I'm going to mention some names throughout the course of this morning, and I think it is encouraging for those individuals to hear your appreciation for what it is that they do. So when those names come up, if, uh, uh, just uh, uh, giving some applause, just acknowledge. We really value and appreciate uh, the work that you do here. Um, in what we're talking about today, it's not to say that we are something special. That's not how we think about God's blessings. We're included. Every single church of which I'm aware has things that they can celebrate on any given week. And we're grateful for all the things that God is doing throughout our community and our world. But we also want to acknowledge what he's been doing within our community of faith and our church uh, family. And you're going to hear some numbers this morning. And here's, it's always risky when you talk about numbers because people can come to the conclusion, oh, it's just about the numbers. And it really isn't. Every single individual has a real life story and a real testimony as to what God is doing in their lives. But many times when it comes to accountability, numbers is actually the easiest way to demonstrate transparency and accountability. So you're gonna hear some about that today. And the information that we're giving you is not just for our council or just for our elders or just for our staff. We make this information public. So you are welcome to all of this information. The first thing I want to focus on this morning, oh, by the way, if you have uh, one of these that was on your chair when you came in, I'll give you page numbers as we go along, uh, and, and you'll be able to see uh, what's listed in there as well. So we're going to be on pages 9 and 10 right now. And when Jesus wanted to change the world, uh, he came as a servant. He understood that serving is what actually makes a difference in our world and changes real lives. In Mark chapter 10, he went on to talk about how he wasn't seeking position or title, that he came to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is how Jesus thought about it. What we might not realize is every single Sunday around here, the average number of volunteers it takes for us to be able to gather and people to be served well is 91. 91 volunteers. How many grateful for 91 people showed up to help out today? Yeah. 
Last year on our active volunteer list, that means they are scheduled regularly to serve, was 486 people. If we were to take all the volunteer hours, which was well over 17,500, and we were to pay minimum wage to every person, it would cost us over a quarter of a million dollars just to compensate at minimum wage. And all of our volunteers are worth way more than minimum wage. At $17,500, if you reduce that to a 40 hour work week, it would actually take you over eight and a half years to complete the work that's done in a single year by our volunteers here. Can we just say thank you to our volunteers? Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, I'm going to be over on pages 11 and 12 now. We'll talk about our global partners. We have a conviction that absolutely no one should be excluded from experiencing the grace of God for themselves or hearing the truth of God. That in our world, unfortunately, sometimes language or education or resources or ethnicity can all become boundary lines that other people will not cross in order to share good news. And we think that that is unacceptable. And there are people that actually, that God actually calls to cross those boundary lines and to take the good news. And they will often go places that are not going to make our top five list for, for vacation places we would like to go. These adventurers have a sense of mission because that's what they're on. They think everyone should be included in the good news of Jesus Christ. And so last year, we gave away a lot of money to missions, and we also gave away a lot of money to benevolence. In fact, if you combine those two things together, it comes out to about $110,000. Why do we do that? Because we actually believe that people should be helped and served by people who have been changed by the grace of God in their lives. And so last year, we did a really interesting thing. We knew that there were churches that were struggling financially and it broke their hearts, but they had to reduce their commitment to missionaries. So last year we decided that we would do what we could to offset that. And all of the missionaries that we already supported, we doubled our commitment to every single one of them and not just for a month, but going forward. And yes, yeah. And we added seven more missionaries. Yeah. So why do we do that? Because nobody should be unaware of God's grace. And there are people who want to go. They have the calling, they have the passion, they have a sense of mission. They're willing to submit to any level of training required. And the only thing that's missing is some resources. And I'm glad that this house is able to help send others to places so that everyone, no matter who they are, no matter where they are, no matter what they've gone through, they get to hear about the good news of Jesus. Amen? Yeah. Um. Then there's things we do just within our community. And by that, I don't mean our church. I mean in the greater community in which we live. I'm on pages 13 and 14 now. It could be Christmas gifts to students in our community. It could be Thanksgiving dinners to families that are struggling. It could be backpacks for kids as they're heading to school. There's a lot of local missions and ministries. And they do things that we can't do. And so we don't think that we're separate from them. We're grateful for them. And we want to pour human resources and financial resources into what they do. For example, we helped care for 49 families that were struggling this last year. 34 people serve as volunteers to, to help children in, in schools. There's two schools that we partner with particularly just to go in and help mentor those students and, and help them uh, uh, do better academically. We have 53 volunteers that are part of a network that meets emergency needs when they come in. If, if you've heard of Care Portal, we have 53 three volunteers within our church that already help with that. We've had 54 volunteers that went to work on people's local homes and businesses just to be a support to them in a situation they were struggling with and couldn't have done on their own. We've got five people who've signed up to be mentors one-on-one -on -one with children who do not have a father in the home. And we think it would be really good if they had some additional and extra support 
45 students we supported to be able to participate in Flower City Work Camp, and that doesn't include the 35 vol adult volunteers who took time off of work to show up and not only support our students, but to help make a difference and make Jesus known in the Rochester City neighborhoods. How many are glad for all the work that those folks have done? So if our church was not here, I think, I think you would miss it. I think. If our church were not here, there are people who have never set foot in this facility and they would miss us. And we think it honors Christ for that to be true. Um, let's talk about groups on page 15 if you're there. We don't just want to go wide in our support. We want to go deep in our, our spiritual growth. And so uh, one of the uh, people who's uh, primarily responsible for our group's ministry is uh, one of our, our staff members, Amy Alquist. And she does a phenomenal job not only helping. Yeah, let's say thank you to her. She understands something that sometimes we forget. All spiritual growth doesn't get deposited into us when we sit in rows and we listen to someone like me talk. That if we want to move something from our head to our heart, that usually requires a conversation. And the best way to do that is to get with a small group of people and have real conversations about things that really matter. And her passion for this is absolutely phenomenal. Almost 200 people, uh, participated in our groups last year. And that meant that they didn't just show up to rooms like this, which we value, but they also wanted to move what they were hearing into a place in their heart and have a conversation about it. We think that is super valuable. And by the way, you'll be hearing some more about groups uh, later today. In fact, for you, it might well be the next step in your spiritual growth and development. Uh, then we have a, a deaf ministry. Uh, 9 a.m. service wouldn't be as familiar with this, but in the 11 a.m. service, uh, we have a whole section over here. Uh, Brian and uh, Jennifer Cornwall lead our deaf, deaf ministry, and even though they're not here, let's just uh, thank them right now. They'll be here later. <laughs> Yeah, in case you don't know, this is how you applaud in sign. So let's just try that. Yes, they would love that. Um, when they signed on to be our leaders for deaf ministry, we had roughly about 30 uh, people participating in our deaf community. That number has more than doubled now. And we think that's important because Rochester has the second highest per capita deaf population of any city in the United States of America. This is a huge field where people have often felt disconnected from and sometimes abandoned by hearing churches. And uh, what's really fascinating is that they don't just come and watch an interpreter, they've actually found ways to serve. And so they serve as greeters, they serve in kids' ministry, they serve, in fact, our kids' curriculum, they take that and they, they produce their own ASL uh, version of that for deaf children and for CODAs. In fact, uh, I'll, I'll get to how that video is used later, but aren't we grateful that they're, do, they're creating a resource that can be seen even outside of our church family? Are we grateful for that this morning? Yeah. Uh, we're thrilled for all that they're doing. Um, and there's something really unique about our deaf community, and I've been told this by people within the deaf community and by people who serve the deaf community. Our deaf community is multi-generational. And we don't think twice about that. Because in a hearing world, that's more common. But in the deaf community, it's less common. And uh, last uh, uh, year, we actually, we have a class that is uh, for uh, deaf children and CODIS, children of deaf adults. And last year, we had to open a second classroom for all of the kids that are coming in that are, that are either deaf or children of deaf adults. How many are grateful? They're coming and we get to serve them. Yeah. And I should say there's, uh, our interpreters do a phenomenal job too. God bless them for trying to keep up with me. I just keep waiting for the, some Sunday when their hands actually fall off on the floor. And uh, so grateful. Uh, Julie Salmon actually kind of oversees uh, scheduling all of our interpreters for our events and our services. Can we just say thank you to her as well? Yeah. And then uh, kids ministry and student ministry. Um, kids' ministry is led by Pastor Steve 
Uh, there's over 125 kids on average that show up here in a given Sunday. And uh, he makes sure that uh, they're not just being kept in a quiet place so they don't disturb us. He makes sure that they have a kingdom investment in their life. And Pastor Steve and the rest of our staff understands very well that our kids, our students, and our young adults are not the church of tomorrow. They are the church of today. They're here right now, and they count. Uh, Pastor Stephen Nichols, he actually uh, oversees uh, almost 50 students that come in. Just think about that. How would you like to be responsible for uh, 50 students uh, on a weekly basis? And, uh, and here's what we know is that if a person's life is introduced to the gospel early, it will change the trajectory of their life for all the days they live here and all the days in eternity. And every single life they come in contact with between here and there. And uh, it's just such an amazing investment and so deeply appreciated. Can we say an, uh, a thank you to Pastor Steve, Stephen Nichols, and John Abarca for the incredible work that they do? Yeah. And... Uh, John Barco oversees the, the uh, college age and young adult, and uh, uh, almost 50 of them uh, get together on a weekly basis for small groups, or bi-weekly, I think it is. And then uh, over 70 of them show up for larger events. And uh, that's important to us because what we are regularly told is that according to statistics, once you start getting out of high school, you start caring less about spiritual things or God or church. And uh, our experience is not in line with the statistics that we keep being told. We have found a vibrant and passionate faith in our young adults and our college students, and they keep showing up and they keep investing in each other and in the world around them. How many are grateful for all the work that they are doing? Yeah. In, in fact, uh, those three guys have something they would like to say to you. So if you could just turn your attention to the screen for a minute. Hey Calvary, we want to take a moment to thank you for all of the generosity that you have given with your financial gifts over the past year that have gone to support the ministries of our church. Including the young people and the generation of today of our church family. A portion of every gift that you give goes towards ministry supporting our upcoming generation, our kids, our youth, and our young adults. In our children's ministry, we've been able to invest in creating our own curriculum to build the faith foundation of our kids. And we do that through a series of things, through sharing Bible stories for the kids, uh, creating Bible points that helps them grow in their faith, and then time to discuss that in small groups. And for our youth ministry, we get to do things like meeting every Wednesday night or even things like our youth retreat where we get to introduce our teenagers to a God who loves them and wants a relationship with them. And we get to show them every single week that there is a God that wants to know them, that the teenagers of our world are loved by, by God. And for our young adults, they're going through a time in their life where they have so many questions as they are in the process of making this faith their own and deciding how they want to live it out. And we have volunteers who are meeting with them um, for coffee, for you know, meals, and, and just getting into those, those real life questions. And that wouldn't be possible without your support. And you didn't stop there. Many of you guys didn't just give financially, but you also gave your time to serve as well. Many of our volunteers showed up faithfully to create a safe place for our kids, youth, and young adults to be able to grow in their faith. And we also know that ministry takes time and you guys have invested to one-on-one -on -one relationships uh, with the young people of our church where they can grow, ask questions, and, and learn together with somebody who has walked the faith before. And while a lot of great ministry happens in those one-on-one -on -one contexts, we also know that our youth retreats, you know, kids events, and young adult large group events take lots of volunteer time and planning, and we're just so thankful that you have put so much towards those spaces as well. And you helped make that happen, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um. I'm on page 20 in your booklet now. If, if you're 55 and older, there's a group called Young at Heart. And you might be interested in getting to know uh, some of the folks in, in that group. 
Uh, for some of that group, their faith might be a relatively new experience, but quite honestly, for many of them, it's been tried and tested for decades. And uh, they get together, there's a kind of depth and, and texture to the way that uh, they talk about God and relationships that is born out of experience. And uh, Young at Heart is actually led by uh, Jonathan and Sharon Martino, so can we say thank you to them for the work that they do. Uh, there's a monthly meeting that they have here at the church and uh, uh, on campus and uh, uh, just a, an amazing number of people gathered to participate in enriching relationships, enjoyable lunches, and interesting conversations. And I'm so grateful for the work that they do. Their faith in God and their commitment to each other is, is inspiring. Uh, I'm on page 21 of your booklet now. This is for worship. Uh, how many are grateful for uh, John Iacucci's leadership and the incredible worship we get to enjoy every single Sunday? Yeah. yeah. Um, something on the inside gets stronger when we say things that are true. And uh, the easiest way to say it sometimes is to sing it. And so we're so grateful for that. Last year, our team started venturing into something new, and that's they started creating original content. Some of the songs that uh, you are singing, they won't tell you because they don't like to point attention to themselves. But some of the songs that we sing here on Sunday have actually been written and uh, uh, put together by our worship team. In fact, uh, uh, what I can tell you, this is a groundbreaking news. This is breaking news. We need a little thing at the bottom of the screen right now. Um, Calvary Assembly worship team is actually planning on putting together an album this year that you can have of the original content that they are producing to give glory to God and just kind of link all of our hearts together and express what God is doing in this house. How many are grateful for that? Yeah, that's right. They also uh, lead us in currents and refresh. Those are two special worship nights. Uh, there's one coming up, and if you haven't participated in it, I think you would find it life-giving, and I, I strongly encourage it. Um, uh, I'm gonna go backwards now to page seven, and uh, that kind of gives us an idea of, of where our church family has gone uh, attendance-wise for the last decade. Uh, you'll notice that when COVID hit, we took a hit. And you also notice that we're kind of getting back to pre-COVID numbers right now. We're very grateful for that, not because uh, we actually talk a lot about attendance. We just think it matters that people get together. That uh, I'm very grateful, if you're watching online, I'm very grateful for this opportunity, I really am. It's good, but I think being together in person is even better. What do you think? Amen. Yeah, okay. I, I'm not sure you convinced anybody right there. It's just, yeah. Yeah. Um, we also have some information that we want to share with you uh, financially. And, uh, and so um, Jonathan Sigmund put together a, a video. He's our executive pastor. By the way, could we say thank you for all the work that he does around here? Yeah. He, he leads so much of uh, staff uh, uh, responsibilities and our volunteers were super grateful and he wants to share with you some information about our finances. Church family, can I just start by saying a huge thank you? Our church was more generous than ever before and because of your generosity, We've been able to do incredible ministry for so many people. It's incredibly important to us to be accountable and transparent with our resources. So let's take a peek in on what income we took in and where it was that we spent that. You can see here our categories for how we received income. We have income or contributions to our newly formed adoption fund, benevolence, missions, our building, interest, facility fees, tithes and offerings, and gifts to appreciate our pastoral staff. Your gifts to missions supported over 20 different countries hearing the gospel. Now compared to 2021, our tithes and offerings actually increased by 14.8%, which is amazing considering how that increase has made a huge difference all across our community. We thank God 
for his faithfulness. We also received a one-time earned retention tax credit, which we will be sharing more about in our service. Now, to the expenses. To do great ministry, it costs money. And it's your generosity that continues to allow us to reach and serve our community. We invested in a building where we could come together and worship and draw close to Jesus, in office supplies to help spread the word, and in our 22 staff who help lead and disciple our church. We invested in all our ministries, including a significant increase into our children's ministry. Our church was honored to give over $52,000 away in world missions, which is more than $28,000 above and beyond what was contributed in designated missions funds. Between missions and benevolence, we were able to help young girls at risk of being trafficked, to serve refugees coming across the seas from war-torn countries. We were able to help the homeless in Rochester and to provide support in both Churchville and Clara Barton schools. We were also able to reduce debt on our mortgage, paying down an additional $360,000 towards our principal. This is in addition to our monthly mortgage payment. We gave away more than ever before, and we have dreams to top that again in 2023. We also had well over 100 new givers, which we think is a remarkable sign of health and a great step of growing discipleship for so many in our church. Some of those new givers are children, which is just so rewarding to think of them learning at such a young age to be generous with their resources. They will be an incredible blessing to so many throughout their lifetime. Now, I'm not exaggerating. I could talk about the stories of God using the resources you've entrusted to us for a long time. But what I want you to know most of all is that your investment is impacting people's hearts and their minds. Uh, just this last week, I had a young woman come up to me and shared how she came with one of her friends and she put her hope in Jesus for the first time. And I'll tell you what, that just never gets old and you are what helped make that be possible. And this never gets old from heaven's perspective either. So I just want us to say sincerely, Thank you. Your generosity is impacting our neighborhoods and our whole globe. We count it an honor to call you a partner. So Calvary Assembly, thank you for your faithfulness. Now, <clears throat> uh, that's way more than used to come in. <laughs> I can tell you that. Our adoption fund, which we just launched, uh, uh, last year uh, now has uh, close to $45,000 in it to help families who are looking to adopt a child, but the expenses of doing so is prohibiting them. And so this year we will be taking applications to help enlarge families. And that's not just limited to the Calvary Assembly family, it's in, people who uh, follow Christ in our community. We want to uh, invest in them as well. So how many are grateful for that generosity? Yeah, that's a big deal. Um, uh, you heard uh, Jonathan mention uh, the earned retention tax credit. There was something that the government wanted to do as a result of uh, COVID uh, limitations and mandates. And uh, you could see if you look at our attendance numbers, uh, we basically lost attendance of 10 years uh, during that time. And what the government wanted to do was, uh, uh, people might not be aware of this, churches are tax exempt in terms of property and churches are tax exempt in terms of sales tax. We are not tax exempt when it comes to payroll tax. And so we pay uh, the same amount any business would. And there's some unique features to a pastoral staff, but um, which actually is a, a larger number than a lower number. And so we pay that. And what the government wanted to do was to provide a relief from having to pay those payroll taxes during COVID. But um, and by the time that that got done, those taxes were already paid. 
And so uh, we could show that uh, we, we were not uh, able to do outreach events like our family fun day, our Easter egg hunts, those kinds of things. Uh, our attendance was very limited due to social distancing and uh, all the things that we, we tried our best to comply with what was asked of us. And so the government, because they, they were unable to get that decision done first, they actually made a decision, and this is not just for us, uh, lots of businesses and churches uh, benefited from this, to return the payroll taxes that were paid out. And so we received back from the government in a one-time gift uh, an amount of $221,800. I have so many things I want to say. Um, we're not counting that as income because technically it's not. It, it's a return of, of payroll taxes. But uh, we do think that this is a unique gift that God has poured into our lives and we're looking for ways that we can do that and, and not just to consume it on ourselves. And so uh, our church council and our staff are having very excited conversations. In what ways could we be generous with this to make a difference in the kingdom? And so we're very happy about that. Uh, our approach to budgeting has been conservative for sure. And uh, even coming out of COVID, we were unsure given the economy and how people would feel about gathering again. And our goal has been to be wise and be generous. And most people consider those opposing forces. And what we've discovered is that when you put Jesus first, he brings wisdom and generosity together in ways we couldn't calculate. And we get to make a real difference in a real world, in real lives. So I'm super grateful for everything that you uh, give and all the resources that you have entrusted into our care. Um, by the way, uh, we, we don't, uh, we have, uh, uh, last year we had 22 on staff. We don't discuss or disclose individual staff member salaries uh, for obvious reasons I think you would appreciate. But um, uh, every year for Vision Sunday, I actually bring my W-2. And so there's a little table next to the chair I sit at up front and my W-2 is on there. If you want to know what I make, uh, you are welcome to see that. And uh, all you have to do is just, I'm, I'm gonna ask that you not take pictures of that and post it on social media for obvious reasons. I have blacked out my social security number and uh, other uh, information that <laughs> I can't risk to go out. Okay. You may have a lot more questions related to uh, our finances because this is a very limited time to give a report. And so right after the service this morning, uh, our business administrator, our executive pastor, and myself will be in the conference room it's just uh, behind our lobby, it's the glass room, and if you have any questions, and by that I mean any question, we'll do our best to uh, answer that for you. Uh, also, just on the back cover of this uh, booklet is all the ways you can connect with our church for uh, social media. And now I'm going to preach the fastest message I've ever preached in my life. Um, in fact, it's going to be so fast that I will ask the worship team to come up now. Ephesians 3, verse 20 says, Now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. God is able to do more if we're willing to trust him. Our trust and our imagination can limit what we're willing to try. So how is God able to do more than we imagine? And that verse tells us, according to his power that's at work within us, which is a problem. Because what we would rather is that according to his power that works for us that we really do wish sometimes that we didn't have to roll up our sleeves or drain our bank accounts or step up in ways that require our strength, that we wouldn't have to wade into complicated situations where people are broken and there's not a lot of light to share. And in all of that, we just we wish God could do it for us.
but God does more than we can imagine by working through us. And it's messy. And it's exhausting. And it forces you to deal with your own anxieties and a sense of inadequacy, for sure. But it is what makes the difference. There are so many people in our world who feel hopeless, who feel unnoticed. The anxiety that they carry separates them from the people they need the most in their lives. And it's so easy for the church to glance away and have nothing to say. And so there are people who, they're giving up. They don't ever think anything's gonna work for them. They're often embarrassed. They feel left out. They look at everybody else and can't imagine how everybody else has, made, has, has been able to accomplish everything that they have. They feel like failures. They have secret fears, sometimes addictions, sometimes desires, and they have no place to go with them. And they hear words like this, that God is building a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, and they're pretty sure they're the stain and the wrinkle nobody wants. <laughs> the glory of God is seen in Christ he didn't come with massive armies or massive accumulation of wealth. He, he came as a poor and powerless person in a family that wound up being refugees. He lived with little, but accomplished so much. The glory of Christ wasn't seen in the most attractive person in the world or the most powerful person in the world or the wealthiest person in the world. The glory of, the glory of God was seen in Christ on a cross where tears were flowing down his cheeks and blood was streaming out of his side and off of his head. And it was in the brokenness of Jesus that we actually saw the glory of God. And there's something to take away from that. It's in the brokenness of people that we see the glory of the church. We're not better than others. In fact, it's our willingness to be vulnerable and confess and acknowledge we struggle and we're weak and we're insecure and we need help and we need hope. And when we come together and do that, people see Jesus. <laughs> they do, they see Jesus. <laughs> so Father, we're not here because we think we're better. We're here because we know how much we need help. Help us show you and all we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.